Uh, I'd like to talk today about uh, about the remaking of, of black remaking of Black America, uh, and talk about that great moment that we stand in the shadow of, and then try to understand something about how how we got uh, how we got there. Uh, this, of course, is an extraordinary moment in the history of African America and America, given the contentious. Uh, if absolutely mean nature of American politics at the present time. In some ways, it seems somewhat besides the point to give a cheer, but I'll give a cheer. Uh, instead, what I'd like to do is to explore with you how we arrived at this moment and what it means for an understanding of our past as well as our future. Normally, uh, this would lead me to step back uh, to our beginnings, to that gangplank at Jamestown in 1619, uh, to the promise of the American Revolution in 1776, to that electric moment uh, in January 1st, 1863, these ground zeros of American racial history. And of course, as a historian of slavery, uh, those moments are especially inviting. Instead, what I'd like to do today is to jump ahead to the summer of 1965, when the United States Congress enacts two landmark pieces of legislation. The Voting Rights Act uh, of 1965 and the Immigration and Nationality Act of the same year. In August of that year, President Lyndon Johnson uh, traveled to Capitol Hill and signed the first of these new enactments in the glare of uh, TV cameras surrounded by the luminaries of the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King, James Farmer, John Lewis, and, and others, uh, silhouetted uh, by the statue of Abraham Lincoln, Jack, uh, Johnson emphasized uh, 104 years earlier, on that very spot, uh, the great emancipator uh, himself had signed a bill, uh, quote, freeing the slaves uh, pressed into Civil War duty by the Confederacy. Now, Johnson found this connection with the nearly first, uh, forgotten first Confiscation Act nearly irresistible, and one can only wonder uh, what aid dug up that connection. Uh, clearly, there's a purpose for history majors uh, here. Uh, he celebrated the enfranchisement of millions of African Americans who had been denied the suffrage by that ugly combination of political subterfuge and raw violence, uh, revealing uh, the furtherance of the great emancipator's work uh, privately. More soberly, however, Johnson prophesied the demise of that coalition of Southern conservatives and Northern liberals uh, upon which uh, his own Democratic Party, uh, indeed his own presidency, uh, rested. Johnson's predictions uh, proved right in both instances, uh, armed with fresh guarantees of fresh guarantees of the franchise refusing to be intimidated by the legal challenges and extra legal violence. Black men and women rushed to register to vote uh, to take their place on the hustings. And as they did, American politics uh, made a swift uh, and lasting change. The realignment of partisanship uh, took a variety of forms. Embracing the Democratic Party that had abandoned its historic defense of white supremacy, now to midwife uh, black enfranchisement, African Americans uh, cut their remaining ties to the party of Lincoln. Republicans uh, did very little to prevent their departure. Instead, they hurriedly shed the last remnants of their own emancipation, emancipatory inheritance uh, First, in the guise of Richard Nixon's Southern strategy, uh, uh, Republicans welcomed white Democrats and others who opposed the Civil Rights Revolution. In the years that followed, they employed the uh, politically charged issues of busing, welfare, affirmative action to become the party of racial reaction. By 1980, it seemed only fitting uh, seemed only fitting that Ronald Reagan announced his candidacy for the presidency in Philadelphia, Mississippi the site of the murder of three civil rights uh, workers. Republicans employed the barely disguised racialist code words of law and order, neighborhood schools, reverse discrimination. They invented black welfare queens. They publicized the recidivist uh, uh, Willie Horton to secure a political hegemony. Democrats uh, became identified, uh, often much to their dismay, uh, with the policies and programs uh, favored by black Americans. 
By the end of the 20th century, uh, black voters had become the Democratic Party's uh, most reliable constituency. Soon after signing that Voting Rights Act of 1965, President Johnson seeking a, a, seeking a suitable uh, symbolic location to celebrate an, yet another legislative triumph traveled to Bedslow, now Liberty's Island in New York Harbor, and there at the foot of the Statue of Liberty signed the Immigration and Nationality Act. Boasting uh, that the United States, more than any country, uh, had been a nation of immigrants, uh, Johnson echoed the inscription at the statute's base to uh, recalled the commitment to sheltering uh, the world's tired and poor and huddled masses. Johnson gloried in the demise of that, quote, twisted and distorted harsh injustice of the national origins quota system put in place in 1924 and then reaffirmed by the 1952 McCarran-Walter Act. That nativist-inspired uh, legislation asserted uh, the nation's uh, Nordic uh, identity, uh, denied uh, the, quote, undeniable races a place in American nationality by establishing quotas uh, that favored Western and Northern Europeans. It discriminated against Southern and Eastern European, excluding uh, most of the rest of the world, especially uh, Africans and, and Asians. Uh, again, Johnson uh, noted the nation was moving closer to fulfilling its egalitarian uh, promise uh, and put a point on his remarks by declaring Ellis Island, uh, the arrival point of millions of previously marginalized Eastern and European, um, Eastern and Europeans, uh, uh, making that into a national monument. Few Americans, uh, certainly few black Americans, expected the Immigration and Nationality Act uh, would have a similar transformative impact on African American life. While black leaders rejoiced at the passage of the Civil Rights Act, uh, they generally ignored the passage of this new reform of immigration. A few African Americans believed it had much to do with them. No prominent black leader had joined Johnson at the Statue of Liberty to witness the signing of this new legislation. The black press uh, hardly took notice of the occasion. Few imagined that the expansion of immigration might have as profound an impact on black society as the expansion of the suffrage. But during the next 40 years, black men and women poured into the United States at an ever-increasing rate. The arrival of foreign-born black people began slowly in the 1960s. Uh, it increased steadily in succeeding decades. Uh, by the 1970s, the United States uh, once again had become a destination uh, for the African diaspora. In the years that followed, the rate uh, continued to accelerate. More arriving in the 1980s than in the 1970s, yet more arriving in the 1990s than in the 1980s. The numbers continued to swell into the 21st century so that African American population largely closed uh, since the slave trade was closed in 1808. Uh, opened uh, to increasingly uh, to the outside. Uh, during the last decade of the 20th uh, century, uh, uh, these new immigrants accounted for fully one quarter of the growth of the uh, African American population. While the diverse definitions uh, of race and the vagaries of enumerations by national origins make it impossible to calculate the precise number uh, of black arrivals, uh, uh, several million black men and women uh, entered the United States in the last third of the 20th century and the first years of the 21st century. Uh, they were but a small part of that massive migration that followed the 1965 reform of immigration, but their arrival remade black America, where the, whereas less than one person uh, in a hundred uh, was foreign born prior to 1965, a proportion which is somewhere to the right of the decimal point, immigrants uh, composed one in 20 uh, uh, by 2000 and have increased uh, since then. Uh, one in 10 immigrant or a child of immigrants uh, uh, composed the black population by the end of the uh, century. Between 1965 and the present, uh, more Africans have arrived in the United States than arrived during the period of the slave uh, trade. 
Black America, like white America, has once again become an immigrant, uh, an immigrant uh, society. Like other immigrants, of course, the new arrive, newly arriving uh, black uh, uh, people did not simply spread out openly, uh, evenly across the land. In many cities, the proportion of black people of foreign birth was double of the national average. In my own hometown of Washington, it's almost 17 uh, percent. Uh, in New York City, uh, always an anomaly, but sometimes a harbinger. Uh, immigrants composed uh, better than one in three uh, members of the black population. And immigrants and their children, and I think in some ways it's best to think of immigrants and their children sharing an experience, uh, uh, probably make over half of the black population of New York. Uh, Writing at the beginning of the 21st uh, century and speaking of African-Caribbean immigrants, one scholar estimated that the, the current rate of immigration persists. The first and second generation immigrants would soon outnumber uh, black New Yorkers. Uh, and as we know, uh, it did not, uh, uh, if we, the, the great uh, economic crash did not happen and intervene in migratory patterns that probably, that probably would, have, would, have taken, would have taken place. In many ways, small and large, then, African-American society has begun to reflect that transition. In New York, the Roman Catholic diocese uh, added masses in Ashante and Fonte, uh, while black Americans marched in the West Indian uh, uh, Carnival on Labor Day uh, and Dominican Day uh, parades. In Chicago, Cameroonians uh, celebrate their nation's independence that day. At the DuSable uh, a Museum of African American History uh, annually hosts the, the Nigerian uh, uh, Festival. Uh, the experience and interest of these new arrivals has often put them at odds uh, with the uh, native uh, African-American populations. These differences have expressed themselves in a whole variety of ways which resonated uh, beyond a preference uh, for soccer over basketball, for foo-foos over fries, uh, or even the experience, uh, the exchange of mean-spirited uh, schoolyard epithets. Uh, African Americans uh, frequently viewed uh, these new immigrants uh, with suspicion, a uh, concern that the new arrivals would take their jobs, uh, a fear compounded by the view, often articulated by white employers, that immigrants were more industrious and more disciplined uh, than the natives. Uh, uh, the ability of some immigrants to transport their wealth, their education, their connections uh, from their homeland. Uh, African immigrants, uh, as it turns out, uh, are the most uh, highly educated of all immigrant populations, including the various Asian immigrant uh, populations. Nearly all have high school diplomas. Many have multiple degrees, multiple college degrees. Uh, uh, seems to affirm uh, that uh, seem to affirm uh, uh, that the uh, suspicions that these newcomers were elbowing them aside. Uh, competition uh, with the newcomers. Uh, uh, many natives uh, saw themselves uh, falling behind in everything uh, for the competition with sexual partners and, and education. Uh, uh, several years ago when administrators at Harvard University who were eager to demonstrate the success of their diversity initiatives uh, uh, gathered uh, black students uh, to celebrate the expanded black uh, enrollment at Harvard. Uh, officials were uh, surprised and also a bit embarrassed to discover that most of these uh, were Africans uh, or Caribbeans uh, in, in origins. Uh, this sense of being outpaced uh, uh, stoked jealousies that manifested in a desire for, of a common heritage. Uh, newly arrived uh, were often seen as acting as white, not really being black. Uh, uh, the newcomers' uh, desire to maintain their ties with their countrymen and women, uh, their own churches, their own associations, their own endogenous marriages, their own culinary preferences, uh, their frequent returns to their homelands, their celebration of their own holidays and heroes uh, seem to affirm uh, differences in the eyes of African Americans. Uh, and while often they shared the same color and of course the same African root, they often seem that they had little in common. Even the recognition of similar circumstance and appreciation of common ancestries did not always draw natives and newcomers together.
Uh, some Africans interpreted the, uh, the solidarities of the immigrant communities as arrogance, uh, conceit uh, embodied in distinctive uh, uh, institutions and, and social distance, uh, uh, both physical and social, uh, uh, from the native African American uh, community. Uh, newcomers often return the kind of condescension in, in time, uh, displaying their own brands of intolerance, if not outright prejudice. Uh, they boasted of their own special work ethic. Uh, they compared their ambitions favorably uh, to that of uh, African Americans, laboring at several jobs, uh, attending night school, rising early in the morning uh, to open their small shops. They ridiculed the, the knots of unemployed uh, uh, black men who occupied street corners in black neighborhoods, uh, of the women who lined up uh, uh, for food stamps. Uh, advancing their own children's education or assuring a, a higher SAT score with private tutors and other academic supplements. Uh, these upward-striving immigrants often looked askant uh, on the large numbers of African-American high school dropouts, uh, uh, giving voice to that traditional stereotype of African-American economic dependency and criminality uh, that white Americans had often uh, employed. They condemned uh, the unsuccessful uh, African-American neighbors uh, in ways that infuriated uh, the natives. Uh, now, Barack Obama's father did not arrive in the United States under this new immigration law. And his son, of course, was born prior uh, to that historic reform of civil rights. But Barack comes of age in a society very much shaped by the changes initiated by these two laws. And the, the interplay between them propelled him into a position that suggests how the lives of African American peoples at the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century was and continues to be reshaped by the changes set in motion in 1965 and how those changes might lead us to rethink the African-American past. Now, like many children of immigrants, Barack Obama struggled to define his own sense of self. In his autobiography, his great autobiography, Dreams uh, from My Father, which really is a terrific, uh, terrific read if you haven't read it, uh, he unfolds this complex genealogy this peripatetic childhood, this discovery of what he calls uh, the need uh, of a race uh, as he tries to map out the multiple meanings of blackness between Jakarta and Nairobi until he finds his own African-American self on the south side of Chicago. Obama struggles to speak to a new black society for his life was framed by the events of 1965. The legislative triumphs of that year not only presented possibilities that were previously unimaginable, but they also directed those possibilities uh, in particular ways. In 1991, returning to Chicago with a Harvard Law degree and political ambitions aplenty, Obama naturally gravitates to that Democratic Party which had only recently uh, elected a charismatic black mayor and which of course dominated African American politics as much as it in that city as much as it did in the nation at large. Uh, he played a small role in voter registration drives during 1992 election and then as he says in his autobiography begins to construct a political identity for himself. Four years later uh, drawing on his record as a community organizer, Obama won uh, a Democratic seat in the Illinois State Senate, where he immediately gains a reputation as a political comer. But as Obama tries to expand his political reach, he finds that his immigrant origins confound his political ambitions. Uh, in 2000, he challenges Bobby Rush the Democratic incumbent representing the south side of Chicago for a seat in the House of Representatives. Obama identifies Rush, a former Black Panther who had only recently been defeated as in the Democratic mayorality uh, primary with, quote, the politics rooted in the past. Rush, who had spent his life in Chicago, happily accepts 
that ground. He advertises his own place as a founder of the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party. He dismisses Obama as an outsider with a strange lineage, a foreign upbringing, a peculiar name, and little knowledge of the African American experience. Quote, Barack Obama went to Harvard and became an educated fool, says Rush, uh, uh, to inform his constituency. Uh, uh, Barack, uh, quote, is a person uh, who read about the civil rights protest and thinks he knows all about it. There were others that uh, were even more direct uh, than that. Uh, Barack is viewed as part, to, as, as part to be the white man in, uh, of, in black face in our community, asserted one South Side politico. And many believe uh, the charge uh, to be uh, more than self-evident. Uh, Bobby Rush crushed uh, the newcomer, winning re-election uh, by more than a two-to-one uh, margin. By 2004, Obama had recovered from his defeat, redoubled his ambitions, and declared for the United States Senate. His black Republican opponent, Alan Keyes, drawing a lesson from Russia's victory, uh, uh, sought to undercut Obama's support within the black community by counterposing his own family's roots uh, in the slave South to Obama's peculiar lineage. Quote, Barack Obama claims uh, to be an Af of African American heritage, uh, asserts uh, Keyes, uh, 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 of his equally dark-skinned uh, opponent. Uh, but he continued. But uh, Keyes continued, uh, "We are not of the same heritage. My ancestors toiled in slavery in this country. My consciousness, who I am as a person, has been shaped uh, by that struggle. Deeply emotional, deeply painful, with the reality of that heritage." This time, of course, Obama was ready. Demonstrating, demonstrating his rootedness, uh, not only by uh, advertising his community service, but also by his choice of recreation, pick up basketball. <laughs> Obama dispatches uh, Keyes, uh, but not the concerns that Keyes had raised about Obama's relationship to the historic uh, African American experience. When he announces for the presidential bid, the issue explodes on the national stage. Uh, Stanley Crouch, a combative African-American music uh, critic who sounds uh, more like uh, the nativist uh, Henry Cabot Lodge of another era, uh, reiterates uh, uh, Keyes' campaign screeds. Uh, Obama, quote, lived, uh, has not lived the life of a black American in a matter that soon finds its way onto the front page of the New York Times, uh, Newsweek, and other venues. Is Obama really black? Uh, asked Crouch in a manner that anticipates the answer. Others, uh, other than color, uh, Obama did not or does not share the heritage of the majority of black Americans uh, who are descendant of plantation slaves. So when black Americans are referred to Obama as one of us, Crouch concluded, I don't even know what they're talking about. The question, of course, of whether Obama is black enough soon reverberates through inner city barbershops and beauty parlors uh, during the early months of 2007. While some fixated on matters of Obama's mixed racial origins, his class standing, his elite education, uh, uh, Crouch's broadside uh, kept the focus on the increasingly tangled relations uh, between African Americans and the newly arrived people of African descent, or what Deborah Dickinson, uh, a black uh, novelist, uh, uh, calls the distinction between black immigrants and African Americans that lay buried in the his history of competitive intra-racial tensions and the cultural differences which have never been resolved. Dickin Dickinson's, uh, whose fiction uh, pivots around uh, the matter of African American identity, then took the time to draw the lines even more sharply. Quote, black in our political and social reality means those who are descended from West African slaves. Voluntary immigrants of African descent, even those descended from West African, uh, from West Indian slaves are just that, voluntary immigrants of African descent with markedly different outlooks uh, on the role of race in their lives and politics. At the, min at the, at the minimum, Dickinson continues, it cannot be assumed with a kind of mind-chopping logic that 
a Nigerian cab driver and a third generation Harlemite have more in common than the fact that a cop won't bother to make the distinction. They are both black in matters of skin color and matters of DNA, but the only the Harlemite, for better or worse, is politically and culturally black as we use the term. Now parsing the differences between a Nigerian cab driver and a third generation resident of Harlem was no idle matter. For at base, Dickinson saw them as central to the very meaning of the African American experience and who would define it. Quote, we know a great deal about black people, uh, Dickinson observed in defining the interracial struggle. We know almost nothing about these immigrants of African descent. And woe be us uh, uh, when this latter group finds their voice and starts saying all kinds of things that we don't want said. This controversy over whether Obama is black enough, uh, and it seems kind of like ancient, ancient history, and kind of a, a particular moment uh, and now. This controversy eventually, of course, uh, disappears, uh, uh, perhaps with the inevitability of Obama's candidacy. Uh, winning seems to have that effect. Uh, during the spring of 2008, of course, Obama is winning, and of course now he has won. In the shadow of that great victory, the controversy uh, seems like so much background noise, uh, kind of an irrelevant anachronism of some previous age, uh, pulp for what Marx had called the lumber room uh, of history. But before we ship it off uh, uh, to Marx's lumber room, we might note that this was not the first time the struggle between established interests, that is natives, within black society and new arrivals shaped African American life. The conflicts uh, of natives and newcomers in the late 20th century and the early 21st century echo those of an earlier era between new arrivals from the south and so-called old settlers uh, in the north, between the forced immigrants uh, uh, from the seaboard south uh, and the established uh, slave communities of the Black Belt plantations during the middle decades of the 19th century, the so-called Second Middle Passage, or the newly arrived Africans, the so-called Bozales, uh, and the established uh, African-American population Creoles uh, uh, during the 17th and 18th century. Viewing African and African-American history as a series of migrations, the great, the great Middle Passage from Africa, that second middle passage from the seaboard south to the Black Belt interior, a third passage from the rural south to the urban north, provides a means uh, to create a new understanding of African American history. Each of these great passages, the newcomers confront uh, both dramatically new circumstances and all of the difficulties of adjusting to a new world, new landscapes, new geographies, new jobs, new work demands, new languages, uh, uh, certainly new families, problems of integration into the established uh, black society, the making and the remaking of African American life. We know fragments of this story, uh, at least uh, as some would tell it. Uh, the 20th century, the so-called old settlers, uh, black men and women of northern birth of several generations, uh, uh, told it something like this, uh, how these new arrivals with their strange accents, their garish dress, their loud music, their religious enthusiasm, their country manners, along with their poverty, and often their color, black as opposed to buff, uh, uh, were greeted with derision by the old settlers of the North uh, in the 20th century who saw their own urban and urbane lifestyle threatened by the new arrivals. Uh, uh, some believed uh, that their own decline on, uh, was, uh, was caused by the entry of these black Southerners uh, into Northern society. And while that decline may have had more to do with economic changes and the accompanying rise of new racial ideologies, uh, the elite instead looked inwards. Uh, they attempted to elevate the newcomers uh, uh, to their own standards of dress and deportment. Uh, admonitions, uh, quote, uh, 
Don't appear on the streets with those old dust caps, dirty aprons, ragged clothes, uh, and above all, keep your mouth shut. Certainly uh, did not make for good intra-racial relations. The new arrivals uh, returned the elite's condescension and kind, and the tensions between the two grew, much as it has in earlier centuries uh, when newcomers like Charles Ball, uh, a Maryland slave, uh, caught up in that internal slave trade in the middle of the 19th century, had to agree to work uh, in the garden of a family of a Georgia uh, slave uh, plantation uh, uh, to which he had been sold to gain acceptance uh, within that plantation, uh, that plantation regime among his fellow slaves. Still earlier in the 18th century, when Africans uh, like uh, Charles Ball's grandfather had returned the slanders of African Americans, uh, declaring them uh, to be a mean and vulgar race, uh, quite beneath uh, his rank uh, and dignity of his former station. The great migration of the late 20th and early 21st century remind us of a lost narrative of African American history as a series of migrations which required the integration of established and new populations uh, uh, to create yet a new society. In each case, uh, central to that remaking of language and religion and music from field hollers to spirituals to the blues to jazz to rhythm and blues, finally to hip hop. Uh, Oh, there was a remaking uh, of African-American family life, the integration of the new into the old to create yet another new world. Uh, the history of African-Americans uh, is framed by the story of people continually forced into these re remakings. Uh, the new migrations which brought, however briefly, Barack Obama's uh, father to the United States, and yet millions more who followed him remind us of another story, a story which is doubtless uh, told in the construction and reconstruction of families, past and future. Now recently we've established uh, the making of a new America, and we perhaps have established it in more ways than we think. Thank you so much. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Floor is open. You need that first question. Yeah. Uh, what I'm very interested in is how you came to be so interested in African American history and slave situation. Well, if you're if you're an American, if you're an American historian, you've got to be interested in slavery because it's a central pole. You can't understand American history without understanding slavery. And slavery, of course, is ground zero for the creation of race. And race, of course, is another central part of American, American, American life. Uh, uh, sometimes that question is asked because of this, right? Uh, and the, you know, part of the answer is, is that uh, it's not simply uh, black people who are involved with slavery. White people are deeply involved <laughs> with the story of uh, the story of slavery, and uh, and those two stories have to be told have to be told together. Yeah. Well, I think it's a wonderful thing. Yes. I've read, I've read uh, a couple of your books, and I've read by, uh, books by Herbert Jefferson, mm -hmm. who's also interested in the same subject. And it's always interesting to me how you come about yeah. being so interested yeah. in the subject. So. Well, we share an admiration for Herbert Gutman. Yeah, well, we're, we're all cousins anyway. Right. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. yeah. Could you comment on uh, what the governor of Virginia just did? <laughs> 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 right. Uh, well, fortunately, I work on the other side of the river, so that's, <laughs> that, 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 that's good. Uh, the politics of slavery are, I mean, are deeply into, you know, I mean, are into, in, integral to American, you know, to American politics in, in all kinds of, you know, in all kinds of ways. Uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's part of uh, debates uh, about, uh, you know, reparations. It's part of uh, debates uh, uh, about, uh, you know, presidents who visit uh, Africa and look out the door of no return. It's part of legislation, you know, that's uh, made by the Congress of the United States that uh, 
the National Park Service has to address the question of slavery at every Civil War battlefield. It's part of lawsuits, you know. So uh, sla slavery remains part of American uh, politics, and it's also ground zero for questions of, you know, for questions of, of race. So it's the governor, the governor of Virginia, uh, has not simply forgotten <laughs> that that uh, you know the Civil War had something to do with slavery. It's a political, you know, it's a political statement to part of his, uh, to part of his uh, his constituency. And if he's surprised at the reaction, that in some ways he's probably pleased with the, you know, pleased with the reaction as uh, the reaction as as uh, as, as well. Uh, and slavery is going to be part of our politics for. You know, for a long and has been, uh, and it keeps popping up, and it will pop up again. Uh, one of the things you learn about studying race is it's never over. Uh, it just takes a different form, and we're seeing it taking a different form. You know, different form now. Yeah. Uh, when you were talking about the, the reaction between uh, African Americans from within the U.S. to immigrants from West mm -hmm. Africa and the Caribbean, are those two separate dynamics? So there's a different dynamic between Native-born African-Americans and Caribbean immigrants and between West African immigrants, or is it immigrants and native-born? Well, I think, I think it's, it's both, and it's complicated because African immigrants are not just African immigrants, but they come from Ghana, they come from Nigeria, There's a, you know, uh, they come from uh, the Horn of Africa, from Somalia, uh, from Ethiopia. Uh, they come from other parts, as, you know, other parts as well, and the same thing can be said about the you know about the uh, about the Caribbean uh, as well. So there are many there are many complicated stories, and within those complicated stories, there are other complicated stories. That, you know there are differences of people who, you know, are refugees uh, uh, from uh, the kind of uh, late twentieth century wars of all against all in Central uh, Africa and Rwanda, who spent uh, months, uh, literally some so some people years uh, in refugee camps. Uh, uh, literally traipsing all over the world before they arrive here, and a Nigerian, uh, you know, oil uh, executive who's, you know, has connections in, you know, in, in Houston and is going to arrive here quite, quite complicated, you know. So it, it's it's a very it's a very complicated and you know and diverse uh, and diverse uh, story that we're kind of only only sorting out. But in terms of the reaction of African Americans who are here to those immigrant groups, is there? Well. Yeah, I think I think I think it goes, you know, it goes both ways, and it, you know, it's complicated, and all of the ways in which the African American community is, you know, is you know is is complicated, and, and whereas I I put a point on you know put a point on differences, uh, many of these new uh, black uh, 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 black immigrants uh, almost immediately embrace a history that would be very familiar to. Uh, most Native African Americans, they celebrate uh, King, they celebrate the civil rights, uh, civil rights movement. So there are, you know, there are a variety of, you know, of complicated, you know, variety of complications as well. But the point is, is that these, you know, history is made by experience. It's not made uh, by melon. It's not made by DNA. You know, it's made by experience. And these are radically different, you know, these are radically different experiences. Uh, which send people off in, in different directions, which lead them to understand their own position in different, you know, in different ways as well. Uh, yeah. I'd like to get, first of all, thank you for your presentation. I'd like to get you to think a little bit about another set of complexities that certainly uh, affect all these dynamics going on with folk we identify mm -hmm. as black or people of African descent. It's thinking that there are some really historic uh, new complexities emerging among people we identify as white. We've now got generations of young white Americans who have never lived under de, de, de jure segregation. The notion of what it means to be white is quite different in some ways, qualitatively different mm -hmm. from virtually any pre generation of white folks in the United States, certainly not in these numbers. Mm -hmm. To me, that's a, a fundamental factor in the election of Obama. Yet we've got these demographic transformations underway that have a lot of people concerned who are white and otherwise, including the coming of folk from West Africa, the Caribbean, and other places, uh, which seems to me to have become a new kind of really complicated dynamic as well. I, mean, I sat through.
talk a few weeks ago about Mitt Romney, but I simply can't believe. <laughs> I, I, I was both embarrassed and infuriated that he could come into my university and give a talk and get a standing ovation from a lot of, I think, my students who were swept up by a story of America that I think was a bold-faced lie. And he told it in my presence as though I didn't exist. Uh, and I'm just astounded that this man can tell this kind of story about the greatness of America, never once mentioned slavery. And that seemed to be accepted as now he's fighting without apology for reclaiming this greatness of America mm -hmm. going forward. So I think there's another whole set of dynamics at work here that is very, very wasn't your subject, but I wonder if you have some yeah. thoughts about. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think the, the point, the point, I think the point, the central point being is that is that race is always redefined, and race is not. It's not simply that we're redefining blackness. Yes, we are redefining blackness. Blackness was redefined with enslavement. Blackness was redefined with emancipation. Blackness was redefined with the Civil Rights Act. It, what it meant to be black became, became, became different. And at the same time, the same thing is happening to what we might call whiteness as, you know, whiteness as, as well, with all of those complexities and, and, and difference. Uh, so that kind of post, you know, like it, it's not that race disappears, you know, with the, with the appearance of this kind of post-civil rights generation of young men and young women who never lived under the segregationist region. I'm talking about my students, my students who attend a university which was not simply a segregated university, it was an exclusive university. You know, you couldn't step on this campus, right? Uh, you know, now that's unknown to most of my students, both black, you know, black and you know, black and white. And they, you know, as a result of that. Blackness and whiteness takes a different meaning. It's not that it disappears, but it's being, you know, it's being reshaped. And, and I guess that's part of the job. Part of the job is to is to define, you know, how, is to define the meaning of blackness and whiteness, you know, in each of these things. What, what blackness and whiteness mean, you know, at the, you know, with the American Revolution, what it means with the Emancipation Proclamation, you know, what it means with the Civil Rights Civil Rights Act, and. Uh, you know, if we get to think that if it's one thing, it's, it's always going to be that, you know, it's fixed, then, you know, then we, we, we're, in, we're in really deep, deep trouble because these are very dynamic, you know, very dynamic, like, you know, ideas. And every time they change, somebody says it's disappeared. You know, it's not disappeared. It's just, you know, it's just a, a re, you know, it's just a re, reworking. Yeah. Ira, yeah. One, one moment of competition that you don't okay. discuss. Is is the the sort of first two decades, first three decades right. of the twentieth century, right. and I wondered why that doesn't uh, play a role yeah. in the, in the story that yeah. you tell. Well, I, I think that it's in 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 some ways it's a a matter of economy, okay. it's a matter of energy, <laughs> uh, and it's you know there are many many you know there's a post you know San Domingue diaspora. You know, from San Domingue, you know, all over. And there's people who move from, you know, uh, Low Country, Virginia, to you know, to the Piedmont. And there are people who move from, from South Carolina to the, you know, to the. So there are many, many, you know, migrations to Kansas. You can go on. So, so what I try to do in this book is to pick, you know, the four migrations which I think are the most most important. And we do have this bubble at the beginning of the 20th century. Where about two hundred thousand or so, uh, not excuse me, twenty thousand, moving the zero here, uh, about twenty thousand people from the Caribbean uh, come in in this kind of little bubble, uh, and I think that's you know that doesn't weigh in with these other you know much larger, much larger migrations. It's not that it's insignificant. It's you know in many ways very important, but in trying to deal with this question of migration. It seemed uh, it seemed not as significant as the significant as the you know as the as the others. Yeah. Hi. Yeah.
I want to pick up on both of the previous comments okay. and add another complication. Mm -hmm. and two more complications. Complications are good. Yeah. yeah. One is the discussion of blackness. Mm -hmm. you, you say it's always changing, but blackness was never the same at any given moment. There's There's been many ways to be black. Right. Um, in the present moment, for example, you mentioned Alan Keyes, for example. Mm -hmm. Alan Keyes is not black like me, mm -hmm. okay? He's on another variety. He's a special kind of Negro. Uh, um, in the early, <laughs> but I think it's important to say that because even among African Americans, there were different kinds oh, of blackness, sure. yeah. and, and they were often in competition with each other. Yeah. When African Americans migrated from the South and say to New York in 1919, uh, and found themselves on the docks, for example, they ran head on into conflict with other African Americans mm -hmm. and with West Indians that had come up the eastern seaboard. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, that we have to look at, at uh, the many shades of blackness in thought and mm -hmm. in practice and see how they're refracted through mm -hmm. class. The other thing about that I'd like you to comment on is on, you talked about the African migrations, what is particularly significant about the post-civil rights migration of Africans, mm -hmm. because there were a lot of Africans here before the civil rights migration, mm -hmm. is that they not only come out of West Africa, they come from all over Africa. Mm -hmm. In Minneapolis, where I, where I went to graduate school, uh, around the university there, when I was in graduate mm -hmm. school, there were no Somalis there. Mm -hmm. Now you can't walk the street without <coughs> the Somali, very huge, huge Somali community. Mm -hmm which is not only East African from the Horn of Africa, but they're also Muslim. Mm -hmm. And they're, and also added to that is the kind of uh, racial conflict that Africans will run into within a community like that. There's enormous conflict over dress and, and working mm -hmm. in public places. Uh, and one other example. And treatment of women. And treatment of women. <laughs> and there's another example. I just came from Boston about a month ago reviewing a program at UMass Boston. The thing that struck me about an old immigrant community, which is the Cape Verdean community, right. uh, at the university yeah. and talking to students, uh, in this moment, this historical moment, those Cape Verdean students identify themselves as African Americans mm -hmm. in contradistinction to their parents who identify themselves trying to be Portuguese. Mm -hmm. And I have a <coughs> verge in my, in my family, mm -hmm. so I've been acquainted with this dialogue for a long time. So on the ground, there are very serious complications. I know of an Ethiopian friend of mine who came here and went to Haverford College in the 60s and became deeply African American as on his way to being a neurosurgeon. Mm -hmm. So I think that we have to be careful about speaking of these groups. And I'd like for you to comment about these complexities because I think there are some uh, on the ground experiences that I'm not sure I'm, I'm convinced that they're going to overtake African Americans. There may be a, a, a mixture that takes place. But I don't think the African American story is going anywhere. And I know it's not going anywhere in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, I'm not sure what you mean by the last comment of going anywhere, but I, I, I would I, I, I concede to you everything you say about complexity, mm -hmm. uh, and I think complexity is you know that is in, in in terms of places of origin, in terms of class, in terms of religion, uh, you know in 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 terms of gender, you know you can go down all of the kind of sociological categories. And yes, we can find great, great complexity, and that complexity ultimately has to be, you know, has to be, uh, has to be addressed. But I would say we also can be overwhelmed by complexity. We can find, you know, so many differences and chop things up in such, you know, in such fine differences, you know, that we we lose sense of a sense of larger, sense of larger, larger patterns. Uh, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not opposed to it, uh, but this is a book. Uh, and this is an argument here that I uh, kind of gave, which is, is, is an attempt to look at an overall pattern, right, between that first migration, the slave trade, and the beginning of the, you know, beginning of the 21st century, and see if there is a larger pattern which we can say shapes African American life in a larger, in a larger sense. And what I'm interested in here is how within what is a very short period of historical time, that is roughly about three centuries, you have these four massive, extraordinarily traumatic migrations. Uh, even the migrations which we say you know, are so-called free migrations, distinct from the slave trade and the internal slave trade, uh, 
When somebody says, you know, I'm going to shoot you, your wife, your kids, and your dog, unless you're off this plantation, you know, in the 20th century, that exa it isn't exactly, uh, you know, volition. As we so the, these, these, massive, these massive migrations within a very short period of time, and then between these massive migrations, a deep embrace of place. So that, you know, at the end of the 18th century, Richard Allen has created African churches and African schools and African benevolent societies. And Africa has moved from one side of the Atlantic uh, to the, you know, Atlantic to the other. And just at that moment, when you move Africa from one side of the Atlantic to the other, somebody says, actually, you guys are not here. You're going to be in Alabama and Mississippi and Louisiana and Arkansas and Texas and so on. And then, again, deep embrace of place, uh, so that by the end of the 19th century, when Du Bois, filled with his kind of German education, uh, goes down to, uh, you know, goes to the south, to here, actually, uh, he finds what he calls a peasantry deeply connected to the land. He can't imagine these people whose lives are governed by seasons and, and agriculture uh, being any place else in the world. He sees them at one uh, with, the, you know, with the land, except we know that those people are going to be out of there you know, within another 50 years, and they're going to be the most urban people in American, in American society. So what, what, I'm con what I'm concerned with here is not obviating or denying, certainly not denying, uh, these complexities, but looking at a, an experience over, you know, over, a, over uh, the time for the first arrival of, two of the slave ships to now, and saying, are there commonalities in this, are there commonalities in this experience, and does this making, this traumatic movement, and then this embrace in place, traumatic movement embrace in place, does that affect, does that affect the black experience in any particular, any particular way? Is there, is that, does that experience? That'll, that ends that, actually. Uh, does that experience in any particular, any particular way? Uh, have a larger, you know, have a larger meaning beyond, you know, you know the, you know these other migrations beyond the differences of, you know, the differences of, of, you know, of, of class. And if it does, then I think, you know, you have to go into that experience and look at, you know, investigate each of these migrations in a way which tries to address, you know, those those differences. Some some of them subtle and some of them, you know, some of them gross to try to see the difference between you know, Somalis and Ghanaians and Barbadians and, and Jamaicans and, you know, all of those, you know, all of those kinds of, you know, kinds of, kinds of difference. So that's what, that's what this, this is about, is trying to see if there's a larger pattern and then, and then, you know, certainly then you try to, you know, you try to kind of post hole and investigate and so on. What I meant yeah. by the last statement right. was about, which I didn't explain in the right. beginning, there's a real tension serious tension occurring in the academy between those who have entered the academy or who are not mm -hmm. over this question of African American. And so what I meant is, I think that that debate is going to continue. Well, I think that debate has always gone on. Yes. But I'm what, asking, what, is blackness, what does blackness mean and who owns blackness, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, there's, you know, great histories of some people, well, you know, you know, I, you know, I'm black, this light-skinned, you know, guy who is, is that, is that part of the black experience? And of course it is part of the black, you know, experience that this light-skinned guy who's four generations free and, you know, has been college educated for three of those uh, generations is, has a different experience, you know, than somebody who's lived in the, you know, lived in the inner city and so on. But the point is, is that is that those are both black experiences, and yes, of course, there are a variety, you know, there are a variety of, of, you know, black, you know, blackness, like whiteness, is always, you know, always, it's always contended. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Let me, let me ask a question, uh, or maybe make a statement. Is not the dynamics exacerbated because white America looks at blacks, regardless of where they are from, and only see blacks. They don't, they don't make a distinction between someone who may be Jamaican, 
white America does not really make, average white America doesn't make that distinction. They look at all of us and see black. I, I, I guess what I would do is I'd modify, I, I see what you're saying, I'd modify the statement just slightly and I would say white Americans uh, do this opportunistically. Sometimes, well, the, the, I'm not speaking of whites in the academy. Well, no, I'm, I'm saying, I'm, I'm talking in a kind of generality to the extent you can talk in the generality about white people or black people. I, I, I would say they do that, you know, historically have done that opportunistically. In some cases, they have found it very, very useful, uh, you know, to see uh, somebody who might look exactly like me, you know, and they say, well, he didn't get off from Mayflower, <laughs> you know. Uh, and you know, and define, and and, so, and 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 see, you know, see blackness as as as, as unified, the one drop rule, you know. Yeah, but in true. some in, in some cases, they have found it very very useful to make those distinctions. Uh, and you can find many, you know, many cases, you know, many cases of that. So I, I think, you know, that's that's done opportunistically, and it's done opportunistically uh, for you know for political you know for political you know political reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'm just wondering, um, there seems to be, um, this doesn't apply just to the work, but mm -hmm. to other works that look at, that look at relationships between African Americans and African Indians. Mm -hmm. There seems to be a template uh, that, that is used up to and that is deployed to understand this relationship. Mm -hmm. Seems to me, you know, my, seems to me that a lot of, you know, hundreds, maybe even thousands of experiences fly under the radar of these templates. Mm -hmm. you know, experiences that don't quite conform to this template of hostility, mutual suspicion, mm -hmm. conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether you know, these this minor stories on the margins, these small stories, mm -hmm. small experiences uh, that, that, are being, that are daily occurring, whether it's African Americans reaching out to Africans, finding their roots in Africa, uh, participating in charity events, Churches constructing connections with churches in Africa, whether it's uh, West African West African immigrants uh, wanting to find out more about the civil rights movement, wanting to go to a black church to get experience. There seems to me to be an alternative way, probably more productive way of, look, of looking at maybe just an alternative way, mm -hmm. maybe not more productive, which is what I, what I've just reduced to simple curiosity mm -hmm. beneath this hostility, beneath this suspicion. There's mm -hmm. always this curiosity. Uh, just each side wants to find out about the other. And um, my question is more uh, methodological. How, as a historian, I mean, how do we get behind some of these this meta narratives? Do we run the risk of these templates hardening into a meta narrative and then you know, uh, getting us into a blind spot where we are not able to capture some of these small stories, mm -hmm. some of these small uh, these experiences that are happening on a daily basis uh, that, that, are, that are just. Uh, fascinating just on, on a practical level, but also may enrich our narrative. Mm -hmm. So how can we as historians or as scholars uh, discuss this issue, uh, constructive narrative that captures uh, this, this relationship in all of, it, all of its complexities while looking at these small stories? I mean, there's, uh, there's a student of mine in this room, I, I won't say her name, uh, who, uh, who I just found out in the course of this semester spent almost a year in Ghana, an African-American student, and uh, you know, came back with a, you know, came back very enriched. I mean, so, so this, this narrative that Africans are deploying the, the, the discourse of cultural authenticity and African Americans are deploying the narrative of uh, experiential authenticity. Uh, this, this student of mine, uh, you know, when I watched her presentation, she did a presentation for me and I saw all this stuff uh, that she did in Ghana. I felt like this, this, this African American uh, student of mine is actually can lay a better can lay uh, can lay a stronger claim to African authenticity than I than I can, mm -hmm. you know, in some ways because she lived in the village uh, for for one year. I mean, so uh, there's all these complexities, and she comes back here and you know, uh, to conclude that you know, somehow uh, that she is perceived. In it. You know, I just I just I just wanted to speak to that from a very methodological uh, point of view as a yeah. historian. How do you? Well, I would, I would say I, I, I do that, or I think anybody would do that in much the same way is that I would study uh, how uh, slaves uh, who are caught up in the uh, internal slave trade, let's say the internal slave trade, this movement of one million people from 
Maryland and Virginia and North Carolina into the Black Belt, into Alabama, and so on, to create this new cotton, this new cotton economy. And as they come in, they meet people who are already there, who've established, uh, who've established the communities. And both things, uh, both things happen. It's the induction of new people into an into a very difficult experience uh, that you shared, and it's also saying, uh, you know, you guys are different, uh, you know, different uh, than us, and then, and then coming to terms, and how people come to terms and eventually uh, create a kind of unified society. How do I study that? Much the same way as I would study uh, people coming up from the south to the cities of the, of the north, where they meet these old settlers uh, who have established communities there since the American Revolution, and black people gaining their freedom after the American Revolution and creating uh, communities of their own and seeing people entering in those communities, in some ways threatening them, in some ways a joyous occasion of meeting, you know, meeting folks uh, like themselves uh, and, in, you know, and, through, and I think you, you, you study that by, you know, in the same ways you study the, the modern uh, post-1965 migration. You look at what people do, you look at what people say, uh, you try to, you know, you try to uh, get as rich and a complex a understanding of that as you, you know, as you can, and the to the degree that you can explain, right? You can explain as many diverse situations uh, with, you know, within the compass of, a, you know, an explanation. That's to the degree that you're, you know, that you're successful. Uh, I don't think you're successful by saying. You know, there are a million stories in the big city. And I don't think you're successful by saying there are only two stories, right? Either hostility or, you know, or friendship. I think probably most of those stories fall somewhere between because these are complex situations and complex relationships. And to the extent that you could, you know, you, you can explicate them clearly, I think then, you know, you've written a good history. And to the extent that, you know, uh, the history seems, you know, wooden and false and so on, then you've not written a particularly, you know, particularly good, you know, good history. But I don't think there's any mystery, you know, to, you know, to doing this. This is a historical situation. You study it as, as best you can, you know, in the way you study any historical situation. You've got what people do and what people say and then what people think they've done and, you know, you've got, you know, and you try to, try to accumulate that, you know, that evidence as best you can. Maybe one more question, okay. uh, Sarah. Yeah. Um, well, thanks for your talk. I, I had a question that, um, that, may, that goes back to the very beginning of your talk, mm -hmm. or, or you, you raised it a couple of times, actually, this sense that this debate uh, that was going on about Obama himself mm -hmm. uh, is in the past, and it's, it's so easy to forget because we've moved on to a whole set of other issues. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that's right, um, partly because um, I'm, his foreignness right, has been raised um, in a variety of ways, and continues right. to be raised right on the on the right, which is a different issue. But it, but it raises for me the question uh, whether you know, 15 months in to his presidency, whether there are signs of um, Obama's significance to this debate uh, ongoing. That is, whether uh, African Americans, uh, as distinct from um, recent immigrants, are viewing him and his performance mm -hmm. differently there, or their relationship to the Democratic Party, or anything, anything else. Um, through this lens of Obama is not quite one of mm -hmm. us, or as one of us. Mm -hmm. um, that is, I'm curious about the extent to whether, the extent to which he's been incorporated uh, through uh, electoral victory. It seemed a little too simple that he mm -hmm. simply the election dismisses or shuts down those questions. Because I'm not certainly hasn't in um, in political rhetoric in other parts of American society. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious. And I guess, um, and I guess a, a follow up question to that is whether. Uh, the, on the optimistic side, right, whether his presidency presents, has presented or inspired, right, any sort of coalition building amongst uh, recent uh, immigrants and black Americans, whether that's a, 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 anything that you see out there happening. Um. Well, I, 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 think the, I think the debate is on a radically different ground mm -hmm. than it was mm -hmm. in uh, 2006, 2007. Uh, like it or not, and people, there are people who are very uncomfortable with Obama. I mean, for obvious, you know, for obvious reasons. Uh, uh, if you wanted a president who was deeply fixated on 
putting a lot of money into the black community, elect a white guy uh, who would be who would need who would need black votes, right? You don't elect a black guy who, in some ways, is you know, some ways has got 90% of the black you know the black pop, you know, population. On the other hand, I think Obama you know sees the you know sees the problem that if you can fix health care, you know you can do a lot for a community which is desperately short of health care. If you can fix employment, you could do a lot, you know, for the black, you know, the black community. I think that's his, you know, that's his, that's his own strategy and, you know, strategy and, and under, you know, an understanding of, uh, understanding of it. Uh, I guess I would, you know, give the same answer, you know, to that is that, uh, the internal politics of race within the black community is no more over than the internal politics of race, you know, in American in American society. But it does take a different form, and I think being president, you know, gives it a you know gives it a different uh, gives it a different uh, you know gives it a different form. Right? Well, thank you very much. This is lots of good for an incredibly stimulating talk and like so much of your work incredibly generative and I feel like the conversation has just begun so we have a reception out in the hallway here okay. uh, if any of you didn't get a chance to uh, ask your question or if you want to continue anything that's come up or just do anything else please join us outside uh, for a drink and some snacks thank you very much for coming it was great